Welcome to Eyes Open. Today is December 26, 2019. I'm Eric Smith and I'm interviewing Julie Rowe, a visionary woman. For those that don't know, don't know Chad Daybell has been my publisher uh, for books. I've written several other books um, and self-published with Eric, but uh, Chad is and has been a close friend. Um, I He first contacted me online um, on a website, a prepper website called Avow, Another Voice of Warning, in February, I think it was February of 2014. I had only seen him in vision and he had seen me in vision. We didn't meet in person until July of 2014 when I met he and his wife, Tammy, and their children. I knew him very well. In fact, we talked on the phone every day while we were writing that book. Um, I wrote it and he would edit it and we would work together on it because he had seen similar things related to the future. And Oh, we talked about foreign troops invading and all kinds of stuff. My angels on the other side of the veil told me that Tammy would, at some point in time in the future, pass to the other side. He came to me later because he's visionary also, and he had been given some insight from, from the light side on the other side of the veil that his wife was going to pass. We talked about it extensively. I do energy work. Um, I did energy work with him to try to help him clear the emotions that he was feeling. He was grieving terribly at the news the light side was giving him in 2014, 15, and 16 with a lot of bad press. Chad was right there by my side every day. Do you think it's possible that Chad and his new wife, Lori, are innocent of any foul play? That, that all these not, only, not, <laughs> not only is it possible, I know he is. Okay. I know Chad Daybell's heart. I know him. Chad and I talked. I knew he had met Lori. I knew they were friends. Last time I talked to Chad was three weeks before Tammy died. Tammy died. He says, the report says, at about, he called in around six in the morning. The the police or whoever, I, I don't know because my sources are secondhand, that apparently Tammy died in her sleep at two in the morning. Chad woke up, up and found her on the floor. He called 911, and he was calm. Now, anybody that knows Chad knows he's calm, and anybody that knows Chad knows he's visionary, and he saw it coming. I scanned Chad's energy. His heart was broken. He couldn't believe that it had happened like that. He and I talked over three years ago, two and a half, three years ago. We had both seen her in a car accident. We thought maybe she was going to go a year ago in a car accident because it, so, it seemed so constant that we both kept seeing this vision. I asked him three weeks before she died, Chad, are you still seeing Tammy dying? And he said, yes, but I don't know how. And I don't remember what else he said about it other than I said, I had been asking too. And then my angel said, yes, she's going to go. She's almost graduated from mortality. I do know that my angels tell me that Chad Dable is being falsely accused of, of a suspicious death of his wife. I do know that if there's foul play involved, which I don't believe there is, it was not Chad. I do know that Tammy got held up by gunpoint a week to a week and a half before she died by a man in black. And I know Chad had nothing to do with it. Those two kids, Lori Vallow's two kids, I see them. The seven-year-old is laughing. He's having a good time. The 17-year-old is watching over him wherever they are. She's been babysitting him. They're in a safe place. Right now, Chad Dable needs friends. And he may not want a friend like me, but I want him to hear me if he listens to this. I am a true friend, no matter what has or hasn't happened. And I believe that he has a good heart. I would like to just personally ask you to put all judgment aside until the facts come out. Um, we live in a very judgmental culture. Um, let's just wait. Wait till the truth comes out. We are your average people that we have everyday struggles like everybody else. We found something that is good. It started out good. We right. found something that helped us to be better. It really has. It helped us to draw closer to our savior. And then we didn't realize what it was turning into. You know, we had no idea that all of these other nasty, dark things were going on behind the scenes. We were just generally trying to do good. And so many of these people following them at the beginning were just like us. And they are, and they are. And so I feel like this interview is to help me kind of be a voice for those people. You are being that voice. So thank you, Girl on Fire. When Chad and Lori's story came out, I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much more to this. It's not just Chad and Lori. 
it's not. And that's why I did the podcast to show like there is so many other people that are doing the exact same things. First off, I want to say that I have been listening to your videos for a while um, on your YouTube channel, Girl on Fire. Yes. And I listened to the parables the, okay. the, that you shared Yeah. Uh, before you came out with a little bit more. Yeah. And it was really interesting to me. And I could tell <laughs> that you were finding your voice. Yeah. I could tell that you were processing a uh-huh. lot. And you were doing it in a way that was safer for yeah. you then. And it was really interesting to me back then. And then when you came out with your last video, was it a week or two ago? When you came out with your video, choices are important. I thought, wow, she's she's now really starting to talk a little bit more and find her voice a little bit more. And after interviewing Sean Little Bear mm-hmm. and hearing a little bit more from Julie. Julie mentioned um, our interview with yes. John Little Bear. I decided to reach out to you and see yeah. if you'd be interested in sharing your voice just a little bit more. And, and here we are. And I'm grateful yeah. that you <laughs> that you said yes to that. I received so much opposition yesterday to not do this interview. <laughs> really? Can I tell you that right now? But it's from people that are fearing speaking up and saying anything yeah one said she was going to have an interview with you and she decided not to and she was trying to convince yeah she girl on fire <laughs> not to do the interview and i was like i'm sorry but i already know what i need to do so i'm sure people are like well who's girl on fire well yeah i'm a real person but it started out this way because i was more scared in the beginning and i just kept kept it because then i realized this isn't about me this is about so many people. Like it's so many people's different stories. I think that everyone would understand your wisdom in being anonymous right now and that it's brave just to talk. I get emails and messages often from family members who say thank you and who are concerned about their family members. Yeah. Who are well within her inner circle and oh, yeah. don't know how to show this for what it is. And so your voice and a bit of your husband's voice too is really important. So thank you for doing this interview. I think I would love to start by just hearing the story and, and who you are, you and your husband Mm -hmm. were listening to Julie Rowe. Is that correct to say? Yeah. I can, I can share how it kind of started. I mean, I said it in my podcast, I explained some, but I can say it again. It's okay. We lived in Louisiana, um, made some family changes and moved back to Utah. I was pregnant with my third child, um, like eight and a half months pregnant. I had given birth to him. And then it was only a few months after that, that we were introduced to Julie Rose first book that she had written but I think it that was published the year before so when I found her book it was in 2015 um and it just opened our eyes uh we had never heard of stuff like that before but we are members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints so there's a lot of concepts in the book that really struck us because that's what we talk about in our church preparing, preparing for disasters, preparing for getting laid off for work, preparing for things that are going to happen in the future. So those things really um, struck us as being important. So we, we were introduced to her book, but we didn't believe it just right away. We had asked father in heaven. And I, so I just want to say, I am a very religious person. Mm -hmm. I'm a very spiritual person. Um, And so when I do speak, I will use those terms. I will use, you know, religious terms or spiritual terms. Some people don't like that. (laughs) Some people don't like that. I don't care. You are. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's just how I speak. But so we had asked our father in heaven, is this true? What do we do if it's true? Like, where do we go from here? We had just made this huge move from Louisiana and everything was kind of all shifting in our life at that time. Okay. Um, we got a distinct, like a very strong impression of it's good. Go forward. Keep moving on. 
read her books. You can listen to her, do whatever you feel you should do with this, but it's a good thing. And so from there, we took it as, okay, if this is what we should be doing, like we're going to go all in. We we're going to get what we think we should get. We're going to prepare. Um, and there were a lot of struggles along the way, but that's how we were introduced to Julie Rowe. Okay. And can I ask what that book was, that first book you read? Um, it's A Greater Tomorrow. That's what okay. that book was called. And that was published by Chad Daybell. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Or not? Yes. Yeah. His publishing company. Uh, yeah. A Spring Creek or something. Spring Creek Publishing. Yeah. Okay. And that makes sense. Yes. The, the LDS Church um, does encourage its members to prepare. Yes. And yes. It's also, it was also published by an LDS publishing yes. company. Yes. So there was probably too much concern over if the church agreed with yeah. this or not. Yeah. Uh -huh. Is that accurate to say? Yes, absolutely. Okay. There, there wasn't any talk on at that time of from the church saying this isn't good. Like, you know, they let people choose what they wanted to read, <laughs> publish, right. all those things. What did the first book cover from Julie Rowe? It was, oh. was it her near-death experience? Yeah, it was her near-death experience. Um, and then things that she saw in that experience pertaining to the future. And that's why she was explaining, you need to prepare these things because these certain events are coming. And she was warned of those events in her near-death experience. Okay. Okay. Like so, natural disasters and yeah. Which just, is really biblical too, yeah. right? Oh, absolutely. So in other words, there was nothing in this book that was too earth shattering. No, was, these are all things that we are taught in our church that we read in the Bible, that we read in the Book of Mormon, that our church has, has another book of. So yeah, these are all things that are just like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So then you read the book, you pray, it feels good then what? Yes. And I, I made the point to mention that I was pregnant only mm -hmm. because when, after I had my child, I had really bad postpartum depression. Okay. Um, and I was stuck in that for a couple of months. Um, so when we, when we were introduced to this book and we read it, we prayed about it. I had a whole new light on life. My whole perspective changed where it helped me to get out of that depression and realize there's more to me to learn. There's more to this world. There's more to our heavenly parents and our savior. There's more, there's higher, greater things that are happening. So that's why as we were preparing and doing these things, we were like, this feels good. Like this feels right for us, not everybody, us. So we had read the book months went by. We, we bought food storage. Um, we bought other things. We were just learning. It was a lot of physical preparations, a lot of physical things. Um, and then we started having some other experiences. So you get the physical along comes the spiritual. Those things are always intertwined with each other. Yeah. Um, I started noticing these things are happening to me, spiritual experiences that I had never experienced before. So I reached out to Julie because she had spoke of similar experiences. And I thought, wow, if she kind of knows some of these things, I want to ask her some questions on it because I had never experienced that. So you found her email. Is that it? And, and yeah, decided to reach on out? her website, she had she was like, please email me if you have questions, reach out to me. It was she was very open to people talking to her and asking questions. Which is such so, a wonderful thing to think. Absolutely. Oh, I can reach out to this yeah. author. Yeah. Yep. So I emailed her and just kind of asked her, like, what do you think about this? Or what does this mean pertaining to what I was experiencing? And, and she responded back very kindly. Um, it really did help me to see like, oh, okay. I had heard of those kind of things, but I never experienced them. So that's kind of how our friendship started. Okay. I reached out to her through email. That's how we started talking. Again, months went by. It wasn't, I didn't talk to her every day. It was like maybe once a month. That was it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so months went by, me and my husband, we were still preparing certain things, but there comes a point when you feel like, okay, I've prepared like a lot of these things. I've checked the box off on, okay, I got sleeping bags. I got food storage. I, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then you're like, okay, well now what? <laughs> 
what do we do now? Um, and all, all in the middle of all that, all these new spiritual insights were starting to happen to me and my husband. And it, we started seeing things completely different than we had ever seen before. It wasn't anything Julie was doing. It wasn't anything that anybody else is doing. It's just, we were being taught. We were being taught by heavenly father, like, no, pay attention to this. This is something that can help you or, you know, just your own personal journey. Right. Yeah. So all the while, as we were preparing, we were experiencing spiritual things as well. So as Which we got reaffirming, oh, go reaffirming yeah, that you're on the right direction. Yes. We also um, started joining different websites, you know, that talk about people, their experiences, spiritual things. So a vow, a voice of warning. So you got on uh, a vow. Yeah, I got on it, but we weren't on it like very much there. It was too much for me. I think there was a lot of people with a lot of opinions of their visions that they had or revelations that they received. And a lot of them was kind of pertaining to, but so everybody needed to read this revelation. It pertains to everybody. And that's, that's not really how it works. You know? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they're more personal things and people were sharing them with each other, but there was a lot of, I think at least for me and my husband confusion as should I believe that? Is that something I should do? I don't know. It was just us noticing at the beginning of there's a lot of people talking a lot of spiritual things happening. And I don't know yeah. if that's something I need to do or not confusion mm -hmm. that way. Okay. But those websites help a lot of people. So your perspective going into it, that's a big thing. Right. Right. Yeah. And yeah. people find community through those websites. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. And that's why I was saying in my podcast that in the beginning of all this, people were helping each other out, preparing physically. People were like, Hey, I know how to go or I know how to um, hunt. I know how to store food. I know how to can. I know how to sew, you know, et cetera. Let me help you. Somebody that doesn't know. So there's a lot of people that were genuinely helping each other to prepare for physical things. I just okay. want to say physical things for sure. So you are at this point establishing more than just a reading author relationship with Julie, yeah. but a friendship. Yeah. You're sharing things about your families maybe and things going uh -huh. on. Would that be yeah. accurate? Yeah. Even a little bit there, not as much on family stuff or anything like that, but it was still more of experiences. But during this time, as we were about to the end of our physical preparing for how we saw it at that time. Cause it's like, it never ends. Let's be honest. Sure. There are never things be, all the time. Never be prepared life, enough. Right. Yeah. yeah. Julie started an organization called the greater tomorrow relief fund GTRF. And so this was probably, I don't know, end of 2015, 2016. I don't know. We had been in it for a little while. She started this organization to help immigrants, mm -hmm. to help people that don't have things prepared for these things that are coming refugees. And so it sounded really great. And she's like, Hey, if anybody wants to help me in this organization, reach out to me, I can use a lot of people in it. You know, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people that reached out to her. She met different people along the way that serve different purposes in this organization. So there's a lot of people that were up with her in, um, like helping with financial stuff or helping with helping make her websites for things, computer stuff, or helping her just get different organization or different groups in this organization set up. If somebody emailed her and was like, Hey, I want to help out. She was like, okay. And, and then it kind of seemed like she started to receive revelations for people on, Hey, I was told that you'd be really good in this area in this organization to help out. And so people were like, yes, I have they a felt purpose. good about that. They felt yeah. good to participate. And yeah. so she was getting sort of all these people to help her yes. and do yeah. things. And so at that point, um, there were people that were getting really close to her because they were there talking about this organization, helping her get it set up, everything like that. And so more people became close to her. But again, it was only like certain people. It wasn't a lot of a lot of people that were very close, just certain people that she, she felt, felt 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. They felt very special <laughs> to be included. So me and my husband reached out and we're like, hey, yeah, we would like to be a part of it. And she's like, OK, <sighs> gosh, this organization, <laughs> along with this organization, there were a lot of men involved in this organization. Okay, a lot of like men. 90 percent. 90 percent was men. <laughs> in helping this Julie. Yes. Okay. Helping Julie. A lot okay. of men that we even knew felt really prompted to help. And they, okay. they reached out to her. And so from that, she created other groups um, with these men. And she would have meetings with them to discuss topics of, hey, when these certain events happen in the future, I need you guys to be there with me to help fight. To yeah, so there'd be like groups of warriors. Warriors. Groups of like healers. Healers. Bodyguards. Bodyguards. So like that. <laughs> Interesting. So it was sort of uh, in recruiting the men, it was yeah. we need warriors, we need strength. Yeah. We need your, yes. your masculine skills. Sort and of you know, at that time, um, I'm not opposed to those things. We have we have soldiers right now. We have men that fight for us or women that Absolutely. fight for us in our, for our country. So Absolutely. those concepts were like, oh, that makes sense, right? But mm -hmm. instead of as much of it, yes, it would be a physical battle because yeah, there would be people that she would tell us we would need to fight. It was more of a spiritual battle. It was like, we're going to go fight against these evil spirits. Like, I need you guys spiritually to be in tune with your fighting warrior attitude. Like, that's Spirit, yeah, your spiritual warrior, in yeah, other words. Which I agree 100% those things are real. Mm -hmm. But now looking back, you're like, oh, okay. I can see some, some things there that you were doing to people to entice people or... You know, I don't know. Yeah, hindsight. Hindsight yeah, is yeah, yeah. helpful. Right. But right. it also makes sense because it is something you believe. So right. Enticement works. Yep. Exactly. It, it makes sense. She's she's using people's beliefs uh, to yeah. entice them yes. to help her, would you say? Yeah. 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 Um, and, and to clarify the evil spirits, were these sure. ever called zombies or were they no. simply? No, okay. no, no, no. We had never heard that term until it came out that Chad used that. In the news. In the news. That, yeah. I never heard that. I don't, I can't say for anybody else around me, but all I know is that we had never heard that term. Okay. So when we say evil spirits, are we, are we talking like, Satan or the adversary? Or are we talking about mortal humans? Um, both. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so she would call them also disembodied spirits. So basically they were spirits that had people that had lived before on earth. Mm -hmm. um, but then they passed on and then they were maybe weren't good people on earth. So then they still followed Satan in the afterlife. So they still cause harm to people here. Okay. So, but I mean... It also talks about in the scriptures, there was, you know, a group of people, spirits before we came to earth that followed Satan. And right. so some of those as well. Yeah. And that is, um, that's the uh, LDS doctrine yeah. that yeah. those who um, are here on earth are righteous because we followed. Yeah. We Christ. chose to follow Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there are spirits who chose to follow Satan. Yes. And they, so were, is, they never received bodies here on earth. Right, yeah, right. Never born, so, so in, in other words, Julie was saying those spirits would be here, um, and we have to get into our warrior spiritual mindset. Yes, to battle them. Yeah, she would have meetings with these men, um, in just different areas or you know different states, Idaho, Utah. I don't know if other places, but she would have different groups, and in those meetings, she would talk about different things. But none of the wives were ever included. It was just the men. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. So would she she have your husband help, and you weren't invited? Yeah. A lot of it too was that she didn't want these men talking about it with anybody else. But I mean, my husband would tell me some things. Obviously, we talk. Yeah. We're each other's companion. We talk about those things. We help each other. But some of the stuff, even then, he felt like, I can't tell you. And it's just <laughs> like, okay. You know, um, at that point, again, hindsight looking back, you can see that she had started 
separating people like in their marriages. Wow. Just the mindset of like, well, these men can't talk to their wives about this. This is way too spiritual or more important information that only they can know. Maybe yeah. to protect their families, maybe to protect themselves or whatever. So they shouldn't tell their wives. So, so another, okay. Wow. So she was, she was sort of dividing or separating. Oh, yeah, marriages. it was absolutely happening. Yeah. Before yeah, sure. I need to clarify this because you okay. were in Louisiana, but you're attending meetings. Are you back now in? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Let me I get your timeline. Clarified. Sure. Yeah. We had moved from Louisiana to Vernal, Utah. Got it. We okay. lived in Vernal for two and a half years. Um, that's where we're introduced to Julie's book. And um, Julie, we, we did end up meeting Julie in the middle of like 2015 after we'd started preparing, but we drove to Idaho to do that. She had had some mm-hmm. meetings in Idaho at that point when we lived in Vernal. Um, and it just had to do with like sometimes her books, just signing books, or it had to do with like, hey, I can see what's going to happen here in this area. I'm going to come talk to you, you group of people. So we drove down to Idaho to listen to her. And so that's when I, I, we met her face to face. We went back to Vernal. We ended up moving to Idaho mm, the, the next year. So we live in Idaho. No. Okay. Got it. <laughs> can I say East Idaho? Can I say you live in East Idaho or yeah. would you rather just? Yeah. I mean, I think it's fine because I think it shows people that there's a lot of people right here and Chad lives right here. Do you know what right. I mean? Um, yeah. So they, she had these groups with these men, but there was one meeting in Idaho. A lot of these men that started becoming closer to her in Idaho, their wives were becoming closer to Julie as well. Um. There was a, there was drama going on with these women. I kind of came on the scene, like knowing them only after the fact of them getting to know each other first. So they already had this weird, maybe not weird. Let's say that this friendly relationship with each other, but yet it was kind of like, don't talk about this because she doesn't know about that. Or, and I'm like coming in here, like, well, I thought we were all on the same page of just being friends. And some Mm -hmm. of them were like, cat fighting <laughs> a little bit jealousy let's just say mm-hmm. jealousy was there um do you there think was- she created that jealousy yes mm-hmm. absolutely there was one meeting that chad was a part of mm-hmm. um and it had to do with some of the wives of these men um i was supposed to go to this one meeting with these wives and i felt like finally i have i can i can be included you know um and Chad was there and it was, I don't know how many women, maybe 10 women were there. Their husbands were, you know, in these meetings with Julie and I was never invited to it. <laughs> uh, whoever it was, I can't remember. He, he never invited me. And Julie had called me later and was like, Hey, did you go to this meeting? And I was like, I didn't know about this meeting. And she's like, well, you were supposed to be there. And I'm like, well, I didn't know about it. And I was all mad, you know, at the time, like, dang it. I missed my opportunity (laughs) Wow! because I wanted to be involved. Everybody in this wanted to feel they had a purpose. Julie would make people feel like you were so important to this cause. Mm -hmm. That's what she did. And so I was like, dang it. I wasn't there. I missed out. Anyways, it was a blessing in disguise. (laughs) That's actually a really interesting point that you're saying of enticement and manipulation that she would make people feel special but she'd yes. only give them just a little bit only a little bit more. at a time uh-huh mm-hmm. yeah it's yeah. interesting so, so i never went to that meeting but she still held meetings for these men um oh gosh how many did she have i don't know well, i was personally at what five or six five or six my and husband went of, to that he knew I of, knew of dozens but of there others, was a lot more meetings more, with more with more saying. men um, but he just didn't at the end there, he wasn't getting invited to any of them, <laughs> which then made yeah. you feel like, well, what happened? Are we what not did I do wrong? Yeah. What did I do wrong? Yeah. How do I need to improve? How do I need to yeah. change? To- and you would try and contact her. And she was the most, she was the hardest person to contact. You could text her and it could take her forever to respond back. Or it could take her one second. Like you just never knew. She never hardly would speak to you on the phone. Us. 
I don't know about other people. I'm sure people closer to her, she did it all the time. But so it was really hard to find answers sometimes. And she would just kind of leave you hanging. So. So you, what was it like with Chad at this meet? Is that the first time you, you met Chad? Um, no, because I wasn't at the meeting. <laughs> oh, oh, right. Yeah. So, so you wanted but to go to the meeting and you couldn't. I, I think we had seen him at other book signings because at that time he started getting on the scene. It was known that, oh, Chad Daybell owns this publishing company and he published Julie Rose book and they know each other. And they've talked about a lot of similar things that they've seen. And so that was just getting around on a vow and it was getting around in other areas that people talked that were preparing, but yeah, he was doing this and he had a lot of similar gifts that Julie does with near death experiences and visions and, and stuff like that. And so I think we had just seen him, you know, at like a book signing thing, but I had never actually spoke to him then at that time. So. Okay. Okay. So are you feeling at this point, um, maybe a little, you know, separated from your husband, he's more involved, you're wanting to be more involved, would that be clear, like, where you are at Um, this moment, or? Actually, our relationship is very close, we're very tight with each other, so we would talk about a lot of these things, so it didn't affect us as much as we saw it affecting other couples that were involved, we would talk sense. about it. And yeah, at times, you know, there was some contention and there was something, but we would get through it. We would work through it. And then we would move on to like, okay, what, what else do we need to do now? But yeah. other couples, yeah, it, it yes, <laughs> it was bad. Okay. Um, it definitely, are we talking divorces, affairs? or what um, we- At that time, at that time, we hadn't seen any, uh, any affairs. We didn't know of any divorces, but we could just see that couples were fighting or disagreeing or the wife would come to me and just complain of, dang it, like, I can't go to this or the husband sometimes would feel like I'm, I have to go to these things. So you got to stay home with the kids. Like, this is my purpose. You stay home and do that. You are not invited. So sometimes the wives would say things to me on how how they felt kind of left out or hurt. And I'm like, Oh, that's not necessarily my experience. Right. Our, but you again, saw it happening to others. Yeah, I saw it happening to other people. That's helpful. So then, then at this point, are all the beliefs still like kind of basic LDS tenants, despite her being enticing and kind of yeah. getting control of yeah. the group? It's still basic LDS. It was tenants. still very basic stuff. But again, as I said, so when we started preparing it seemed like there were a lot of other people that were on the same course, same time frame as we were preparing. Um, and as we got our things, they got their things. And it kind of seemed like there was a lot of people at the same time that they were like, okay, we're done with this. Let's move on to spiritual stuff. Like it just kind of flowed that way. And then, and enough. then we needed more. Yeah. 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 Which to us, that made sense. And, and we were ready for it. Um, but none of this other deeper doctrine stuff had been brought in, talked about yet openly. I'm sure Julie and them were talking about it behind closed doors, but not openly with everybody. Okay. Yeah. So then, so let's keep going. Cause this is, this is just a really interesting timeline and a, this is great insight into how things evolve. Um, oh yeah. Thank you again for sharing. So then, then what, then, then what happens? How do we evolve to the next? Right. Okay, so GTRF, that's getting established. Something had happened, though, as it was starting. That it GTRF came is? The Greater Tomorrow Relief Fund okay. organization. People can look it up and see, like, right. oh, it's a real thing. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I don't think very much has really been done with it. When at that time it got introduced, we were like, let's get things going. And that's kind of how she made it seem. But she needed money from people to mm-hmm. donate to help get it really going. Uh And there was a lot of talk that there was a lot of people that were donating or going to donate a lot of money. I don't, I don't know if that ever happened, but it doesn't seem like it ever really got off anywhere. Like it never took off. So I don't don't know where it stands to this. Yeah. Yeah. So as GTRF started, it went for a few months and then it got to a point where Julie sent out an email for people. um, But certain people, 
and you had to only be invited by Julie to be a part of this online meeting discussion thing. It was like a Zoom call. It was like a Zoom call, but at the time it's like Zoom wasn't, it hadn't a started thing. yet or something. Yeah. Zoom before Zoom. And so it was only certain people. And so we were invited to it, but other people I knew around me hadn't been. So there was contention because it's like, well, why you and not me? <laughs> Just, and that was when it started really, the circle started getting clo- like closed in more of only certain people. Yeah. She was picking and choosing people that she wanted at that point to be hmm. closer to her. Um, it also came out that she sh- was struggling at that time with um, some medication. mental illness stuff. She stopped taking her medication. And so everything with GTRF just kind of stopped. And everybody was like, well, what happened? I thought she was going forward. And it was like, no, she needs a break. She's not taking her medication anymore. Um because she thought she was going to be healed if she stopped taking it. Um, can I ask we had no idea. Can I ask a little more about that had. mental illness? Um, no. Gosh, I don't know. It's so hard to say. What was it? Multiple personalities? Yeah. I think that's what she has. Multiple person. I, I don't know anything Did about it. Back- Did you hear that back there? That, that that was a rumor? Yeah. She told us. Yeah, she had, she had openly talked about that yeah. being at an meetings, issue with at her. some of these meetings, she would say that specifically to the men at some of these meetings that she had mentioned that yeah she had this and so she was dealing with these these uh issues mentally but yet knowing that she still had to move forward with her mission and we had no idea well i guess i didn't at that time and we were like she's on medicine like (laughs) what we didn't know we're like what do we do now now gtrf is halted what do we do you know Mm-hmm. Julie's not here to tell us what to do. Yeah. So in other words, at that point, you realize she's really a leader. You guys don't know what to do without her. Yeah. She's leading this. Yeah. I, to go back to the mental illness, I just want to clarify one thing. She mentioned multiple personalities. I don't know. Do you remember, Paul? She would never talk about it specifically. Yeah, I'm sure there were, it was that- all kind of hush hush. She didn't want people to know. Yeah. It's all vagary. Just like she talks now. She would never talk specific. It was just kind of general talk you know okay but in general terms there was clearly she expressed she had a mental illness yes. uh-huh. she thought she was going to be healed and she stopped taking medication yeah okay. but okay. um her husband also was there with her this whole time and i think he encouraged her to take it and she was like i don't want to take it and i, I <laughs> yeah he he was the the logical side yeah he was her logical one to help keep her like let's keep saying here like, we still got to live in the world. That's good, yeah. but we still got to take care of it. But everything. nobody mm-hmm. really knew him. He stayed distant and she said certain things on purpose. On she, purpose. Kept she kept him away on purpose. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure he could have been like, I want to be there with you. And, and he could have, but no, no, I, I never met him. I never saw him. He never came I to never Idaho. Him that one meeting. I don't, I don't know. I feel for him. Let's just say that he's been through a lot of stuff. A lot. Sounds like he would try to be supportive, yeah. but kept his distance, but tried to keep Only her healthy. because she told him, this is her mission, this is what she's supposed to do, and he needs to let her do it. Mm-hmm. Don't get in the way. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, so he he backed, he, he was in the background. He, yeah, he's he in was... the background. He was keeping their house together, probably, and their kids, and As she would go and travel, he would stay there. He would stay at their house. He would go to his work and go to his job and take care of the kids and kept life together. Yeah. So, okay. So it halted. She stopped taking her meds because she thought it would, um, she thought she was healed and then people didn't know what to do. Thus, she kind of realized she's sort of the leader of this. Yeah. And then, then then probably like a month, a month went by and it was like, okay, we're, she was putting out messages again, or she was starting to talk again to people. And it's like, okay, things are going okay again. She, she had a blog. Um, she would put messages out on like her website, so, you know, it's just different things like that. And it was like, okay, she, she made it past that little hurdle. We're, we're going on again. We're back on this again. And um, during that time we had moved to Idaho and, um, 
and that this is like 2017 yeah 2017 so like this is the span of uh, 2014 when her book was published to 2017 like you know it was a long span it didn't just happen boom 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 did you move there for her and this group and this um no we'd we had been told previously ourselves that we would be we were going to move there okay um, and it's it a didn't personal have anything, choice yeah, yeah it didn't no, have anything to do with her it. yeah that we received that revelation but she had also told us later, like, yeah, I know that you're going to move there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, <laughs> made you feel good. Made you feel yeah, good about like, your decision. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Um, so we moved to Idaho GTRF. They were having more meetings there. And maybe it's just because when we were there in Vernal, there was only like us and another couple that <laughs> was really involved in it. Moving to Idaho where we were, there was a lot of people involved in it. And so we started meeting more people that we had heard of through the grapevine that, oh, this is so-and-so that is this person with Julie or this person, and this is what they do. And there was a lot. There was a lot. Yeah. Eric Smith lives there. And that's how we met, we met him. Um, Joel lives over there. Joel Gervine. We met him there. There's a lot of people. And so we were like, okay, this is where we're supposed to be. We feel like this is where we can help the most. We're around a lot of people that have the same mindset as us. And at this time, we were still like, you know, whatever you need us to do to help, we're there. We want to help. You know, and so, we're willing to do whatever as long as it was good. Yeah. yeah. When you say a lot of people in Idaho uh-huh. involved, I mean, can you kind of help? To oh, us? Sure. Are we talking hundreds? Are we talking? Well, what would you say? She had some in the bigger group, I would say, yeah, two to three hundred. Yeah, an overall group of people that were just preparing had had heard of her books or heard of Chad's. I would say that number's even bigger. I would say it's bigger. Two two to three hundred. There's a new Julie that talked to Julie. That makes sense. There's there's a group that, in general terms, knew and appreciated Julie and were preparing, and then there was the inner circle. Absolutely, yeah. So, So, like, this whole story has layers. There's layers upon layers of groups of people. Yes. yes, there's a big general audience of people that felt preparing was a good thing. And mm-hmm. that's where it was good. That's where people were helping each other out. Then from there, you you go into like the next one, the next inner circle. Um, people started talking more to Julie, you know, being more of like, oh, hey, I want to do stuff. That's kind of like the next circle. And then you mm-hmm. have like an inner those inner. Those are the people that we come to like the preparing of people. Oh, events. those. Okay. They. The middle group of people would go to the preparing people event. Other people would stay out. I'm just going to prepare. I don't need to follow Julie as much. Then the inner group preparing a people events happened in Idaho. A lot of those people showed up. And you guys attended those? Yeah, yeah, we did. Not all of them, but there was just a few that we did. And there was a lot of people there. There was a lot of people there. The Rexford Tabernacle. And I think the Rexford Tabernacle holds like 2,000 people. And it was full both times we went. Yeah. Wow. For a preparing a people conference. Uh Wow. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully this makes sense to you. (laughs) It It makes a lot of sense. At the Rexburg Tabernacle. Yeah. For a preparing a people conference that was held there. Uh It holds about 2000 people. It was full. People are liking what they're hearing. People are into preparing. Yes. Because this is an LDS community overall. Yes, we're right. talking over 90% yeah. LDS. Yes. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And then, so you have that middle group of people, and then you go in from that even, and there's the inner inner groups that were very close to Julie. And, and that that was like the bodyguards. That was like the people that helped her with her organization more and the people that were a lot more closer to Julie. Well, okay. not just and, Julie, and were you but in that add. group? You were in that group. Ah. Uh, um we were, in that group. were we you were running a website stuff for a while i had helped on her blog somewhat when i lived in Vernal. i was a bodyguard at one of her paul was a bodyguard at one of her events that so she did but at this time we were like wow we're really good friends with julie <laughs> we thought like wow she really likes this <laughs> you know yeah i, I don't doubt that there was a, a real friendship there to a certain extent we were at the conference at the tabernacle in Rexburg. And there's just so many people there. Just that's the audience that, you know, felt guided to this, to preparing 
You've moved to Idaho. At this point, has Chad moved to Idaho too? Yeah, he had already moved here like, oh, I don't know, a, a year and a half before we ever moved here. Yeah. Okay. And he let people know he was moving here. He received a revelation <laughs> also to move here. Like, uh, so anyways. Oh, Paul being her bodyguard, people have questions about Julie's bodyguard that she always brings up. How yeah. How did you, how, how were you said to be her bodyguard at an event how does that oh work? Yeah, yeah, yeah so so within this group so in 2017 she was wanting more funding for the gtrf so she was starting to have more exclusive meetings with certain um financial leaders in the area and stuff like that so she she somehow had contacts with a lot of different guys and she 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 had all of them meet. This was in June of 2017. We all met in Payson. And this is like, she stopped taking her medicine and she was having some weird episodes there. And there was a lot of weird energy at this meeting. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm there and I'm trying to figure out who's who and kind of network and figure out. And Jeff's there. Jeff was so concerned. Jeff that, is her husband. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Jeff was so concerned that he came to this meeting too. Um, concerned for her mental state. Yeah, because she was, it was rough. I mean, she was, she was off of her medication. So she was having some issues, you know, mentally and physically. And I think he wanted to just make sure that she got to this meeting and that she got home. Um, so as far as the bodyguard stuff, so we're just, normal people like I never was like gunning for I want to be the top guy or I want to be this or that it was just kind of like I'm here I don't know whatever she wants me to do kind of thing but in this meeting there was all kinds of like uh, so up in this area there was I don't know three or four um, owners of businesses uh, very well off businesses were at this meeting so what this meeting was for was kind of a meeting of the minds of how are we going to get GTRF financially stable so that we can take the next step. So the idea behind GTRF was to make um, safe houses to where you could stash things like four wheelers and snowmobiles. So when natural disasters happen, so it, a natural disaster that would incapacitate a lot of things would be like a solar flare, take out all the computers and cars and four wheelers and everything. So the idea was to make all these safe houses and stash them and, and put them strategically, you know, along the way. So as people on the East coast were working inland and people on the West coast like were migrating working inland, here, walking here, they had places to stay with food and if they needed things. So logistically, in order to pay for all of this, you needed a lot of money. That's just the long and short of it. You needed a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so she was trying to figure out the structure of GTRF, who's going to be, obviously she's the president and CEO, but more specifically, like, you know, she brought in like a pilot and she brought in a guy who's a CPA and brought in um, one of her friends that was, um, from Arizona, a, a female friend from Arizona. I don't want to say her name, um, but just all of these leaders and and uh, the guy who runs all of her current events, he was there as as a leader. He has his own business, and so we were trying to, I guess, you know, a, a meeting of the of of her greatest intelligent people, business wise, to figure out how to get GTRF off the ground. Now, at the same time, she had some friends that were running a very successful um, a nonprofit down there in Provo. And, and they were there, too, to try to give some insight, like, how do you actually, because none of us had really organized a, a, a relief fund or, you know, a nonprofit to where it was going to be successful. So we were trying to figure out how are we going to run it? You know, who's going to do what kind of thing. And Julie's having an episode where it looks like. She, and I don't mean this in a mean way. It looks like she's just insane. Like mentally, she's just not there. And if she's honest, she will say the same thing that she was having a, a really bad bout of whatever's going on. Mm -hmm. and so her as the leader 
it was hard because we were looking for some direction from her and she's kind of out of it and she can't do anything. And so this meeting just kind of blew up. And a lot of these guys saw it. These were the guys who had the money that were going to invest in GTRF. So th- a lot of them, it was, I want to know where my money's going. I want to know how it's going to be spent kind of thing. You know, they, that's, that's what these guys were there for but also to help organize because they've got a business mind and they've been through it. Right. Mm -hmm. But it just kind of blew up and nothing really happened there. Like nothing got organized. Nobody could agree on anything. And I think these big players with the money decided in her mental state that she is now, we just, I'm not going to put money into this. It's a good plan. Right. Again, like girl on fire said is that, this organization was set up for a good thing. We originally got put into this because it was a good thing. We were going to help refugees. We were going to help people. So when natural disasters happen, there's some relief to them. There's help. There's aid. Yeah. Um, and so from that meeting, GTRF basically just blew up. It just never got off the ground. It didn't go anywhere. But then Julie started contacting people individually more exclusively and making more inner tighter circles within the group. And so because of these inner groups, there was, I don't know, there was a meeting I went to that we were just the bodyguards or just the warriors. Bodyguards meaning what were you doing to help Julie? Yeah, exactly. So so part of this group was we all got together before one of her events and she wanted us to run bodyguard stuff because a lot of us were, I've been to some training. I don't have a military background or anything like that, but I have a logical brain and I can read people fairly well. I have some weapons training. So she wanted some physical Physical bodyguard yeah, so men. physical not mental or spiritual she wanted physical bodyguards at this event the real this deal like the, a bouncer yeah so this is the event that well we were just concealed within the the body of the people we weren't okay. like standing at the door or anything like got that. it so nobody knew you were but you were ready so this you is the event that sean bodyguard. Yeah. Yeah. This is the event that Sean Little Bear was just talking about where Julie got up and the alarms were all going off. That was at the Rexburg Tabernacle. That was at the Rexburg Tabernacle is where this was happening. And so there was a group of, I don't know, probably 10 to 12 of us. And she wanted us to all have um, physical security for her. She has her one physical bodyguard bodyguard, joel gervine that follows her around and that's her main bodyguard but he's her spiritual bodyguard as well as physical now too but he was originally set up as a spiritual bodyguard but so there was 10 or 12 of us that were just dispersed throughout the crowd that were going to this meeting anyways um and so i was a bodyguard at that event nothing happened she was just concerned that there was some specific threats is what she said, but she never detailed these threats. And so she just wanted us to be there in case something happened. So okay. that event happened without a hitch. Obviously, you know, Sean Little Bear talked about the alarms going off, which was true. There was a storm that came through and did some weird stuff. So I, I was there. I can confirm that those storms happened, that the alarms did go off. It was weird. Some weird did energy people- was going on. Do people take that as a spiritual moment? Like a so so anytime that there was opposition or weird things like that, Julie would always say, Oh, see, it's the adversary trying to stop me. See that? But I didn't at first I didn't think of it like that. And so then when she would say, like, oh, it's the adversary, then you think like, oh, well, am I just not in tune enough? Like, Hmm. because I'm not thinking that. Like I don't know. I think a lot of people thought that way. You know, you put it into your mind and then you make your question. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So as far as the, to follow the bodyguard tangent. So then in 2019, she's having this energy conference where people pay $500 for her to instruct them on emotionally healed type stuff, the, the energy healing, all that kind of stuff that she's 
doing now to get all of her income. Yeah. So at this meeting specifically, Joel Gervine asked me to be a bodyguard with him. So in this one, I was like a physical bouncer. And you stood up there like with her. So you, we would check people at the door, make sure they didn't have weapons, all that kind of stuff as they come in. This was at the Marriott in oh, Idaho nice. Falls. Interesting. So you were, yeah, you were a bouncer. So I was yeah, like, yeah, literally a physical bodyguard there. Um for and that. you're doing this for free, right? Because some people say, yeah. how does she afford well, bodyguards? Well, this is a service? So, that's <laughs> the th so it was quote unquote for free, but we did want to go to this conference to start with, but we didn't have financial means to pay for it because it well, was about 500 bucks a person. Well, to go. the okay. thing is I reached out to her and she had said, Hey, I'm doing this conference there. And I reached out and was like, Hey, like, I would like to be able to help you. Is there any way I can help in this conference? Because she, she was, was asking for volunteers. Yeah, volunteers to help. And she responded back and was kind of hesitant about it at first. But she was like, yeah, actually, um, how about if you help to organize it and get it set up and figure out where to do it, then you can come for free. And how about you have Paul come and he can help for free, too? That's what happened. Got it. So it's, it's not that you're getting paid, but you get to attend her very yeah. expensive events for free. Just that one. Just yeah, that just you had to pay event. for the others. Well, we didn't go to any others. We had no desire to go to the others after <laughs> just this one. one so. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Obviously nothing happened without a hitch, but yeah. financially at that event, she on average made $400 a person. That was the average. Cause it was like a, it was like 300 just for one, or it was like 400 for two or 500 for the whole day. Yeah. Cause there were different uh, classes taught throughout the day. Yeah. Like a beginning intermediate and expert. All unquote. in the same room. And if you stayed for the whole day, you paid for like, you know, three classes or whatever. So I'm sure like, people wanted to feel like they were an expert, right? Well, yeah. And most people stayed for the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. Or some just showed up for like the intermediate or expert because they already felt they had been introduced to the, the beginning things. Yeah. That's an interesting thing too, to say, you know, to, you know, you don't want to be a beginner. There's already levels being created there with beginner, yeah. Yeah, intermediate, you're behind, like, expert. You're only a beginner, right? So at this one, we had 120 people that were there. That's how many seats we had. And it was full, full, yeah. full, full. So just that one event, she made like, I don't know, I think it figured it out one time and it was like $30,000 just from this one event. Wow. And everybody's wow. working for free. We booked the Marriott and it was like $1,200 for the Marriott. And most so, people were paying cash. Yeah. Not very many people paid via some way for the IRS to trace. She said it was all going to GTRF. This is why a lot of people supported it. So any yeah. money that she made on these events, she first would say, well, it's all going back into my organization. So I'm any not profits doing I make, with it. yeah, it's going to go sure. back to help the relief. Yeah, we got a few you know, operating costs, but for the most part, it's all going back into GTRF and we're going to use it to snowball and do other things. Now she'll come out and say, that's just not true. She's just pocketing it all. She's changing her story. But just that event was, I'll bet she... After paying everything, I'll bet she cleared over 30000 Wow. And that was the second event. And she was having these <laughs> once a month. Yeah, for like that whole year. So, she, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of money involved, and that's where the evil gets introduced really easily is that there's a lot of money. Makes me wonder, right, about Chad and right oh, what yeah. he saw as his motivation. Yeah, so, that's part of his motivation. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Julie started getting really popular. So she would go to these events and speak and Chad would. And when he was there, he would sell his books. And obviously Chad's a publisher. So he's getting the publishing side money and the author side money. Yeah. I don't understand exactly what their agreement was between Chad and Julie, but I've done some research and usually it's about half the cost of the book goes to the publisher. So right. these books are $15. So Chad's making $7 on each book he sells on the publishing side. And then two or three bucks as an author. So he's making $10 a book. And at these events, you've got 2000 people and people want to buy the books and Oh, Hey Chad, can you sign them for me? 
oh, I'm going to buy a book for my friend, you know, multiple copies these people are buying. So for, for these people, they're making, I don't know, I didn't ever see any specific numbers, but they're making a lot of money for very little work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which, this is giving them a lot of money. Yeah, which, which is fine from a business side, but when you intertwine the spiritual to it, it just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Money. Yeah, and this, yeah. in my opinion, 2017 is where it just kind of starts taking a turn for the worse. Right. It no, it makes money. sense. It's okay to make money and have a lucrative business. Yeah. That's one thing. But when you're talking about spiritual preparedness and but they were claiming they never got any money from these right. things, and not paying and not paying yeah. the people working for you. Right. Right. That's where it takes up a whole new yeah. meaning. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So, so February 17, GTRF kind of, exp- kind yeah. of implodes and we go six months with like nothing. Yeah. Don't nothing, hear anything from nothing. anybody. Yeah. And sometimes it would be that way. Sometimes it would just be a big pause and everybody's like, it's quiet. Like Julie's not talking. What's going on? Well, and so all, all of this, like Chad's doing his own side things. So at the beginning, Chad and Julie were known as being like really good friends. They had a lot of things in common. They talked a lot about their spiritual insights with each other. Like that was just known. Um, and so as Julie was doing all these things, Chad was over here doing all these things. Like he was doing more preparing a people conferences. Julie didn't do any more. She did one and then no more because obviously she didn't like certain people and they didn't like her. Um, and so, yeah, Chad, Chad was doing podcasts with preparing people. He did a lot of interviews with them. That's all going on in his area. I had no idea that he was all in Arizona doing stuff. I did. I wasn't in his circle. So that's a whole different circle of people. But so Julie's doing her stuff. So we get to 2018, the beginning of the year. I can't even think of anything that happened, but in July, or August or September of 2018, that is the turning point for all hell breaking loose. I will tell you all of a sudden it got being brought up that the prophet of our church, uh, president Russell M. Nelson was a certain person. I can't remember who he was in a different probation. Um, other people like in our government or other Hollywood people were, Oh, they were these certain people. And I was like, wait, what? Like, what do you mean? Like, you know, certain people that maybe might be looked at as not good people. Well, yeah, that's because they were this evil person that had lived before. Like, that's what they implied was that see, like people lived before as other people. So this concept basically is like reincarnation that's okay. so we're talking more uh probation so yes so the multiple president probations. nelson who is the prophet of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints which is yeah. essentially like the pope to the catholic church oh, for yeah. everyone uh-huh. is now um an evil spirit because he was no, someone evil not before. him he was known as a, a good guy from the bible that okay. was who he was before but some other people like maybe known as not as I don't know. I can't even think of an example right now, but people like maybe in the government. Oh, see, he was this other evil people like that had lived before. Like, for example, maybe Adolf Hitler or something. They would mesh those things together or they would say this Hollywood actress. Look, you can see by the way they're acting. Well, yeah, that's because they were so and so that had lived in like the 1910 or 1900s or 1800s. That wasn't a good person. 2018 is very important because that's when multiple probations got brought into the scene they were introducing reincarnation but saying that to all of us we have lived before as different people in throughout history that makes sense and who is who is saying this julie julie Julie, joel eric uh, um obviously chad believed it i had never well i'd never heard him say it but he was very much a part of it very much so because he was known as the one that would receive these revelations for people. He would know who they were. Julie was the one that was to confirm it for people, for him to say, yes, that's true. Okay. That makes sense. So it's being introduced probably by Julie. And then in, the, in this inner group where we were at in Idaho. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know 
what was the reasoning for it all? But all of a sudden we go from GTRF and preparing to now we're talking about reincarnation stuff, multiple probations. How did that happen? Thank you. And know. let's make it really clear now. Does the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believe in multiple probations? No. They yeah. do not believe in that. So not the way Julie was explaining it. <laughs> yeah. Or Chad. There are yeah. definitely things where they talk about a probation, but a probation is like when you get born, you come to this earth in a different probation. Like it just, this is your experience here on earth. You've lived as a spirit in the spirit world. Now you come here, but they don't, they do not talk about living. As a yeah, absolutely not. They don't agree with that. Yeah, multiple probations to me means reincarnation, just like you said. Julie would say, I know people are going to say this sounds like reincarnation, but it's not. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let us discern for ourselves, <laughs> right? Interesting. And how would she introduce this doctrine that was not part of the church's curriculum? Would she just say this is the deeper doctrine? Yeah, yes, absolutely. So like in my podcast, or especially in my last podcast, I said she talks a lot about deeper spiritual doctrine stuff that is very sacred and she shouldn't be talking and about it the way she is there are things that we just we just can't understand here while we're here and there are things that you know are kept sacred for a reason and so when this concept got brought up to people i had heard it from some people that i know that oh so and so was this person before and i was like what and then me and my husband went out to dinner and that's when with her that's when she just kind of like vomited all this information on us but didn't really explain what it was or wh like why she's doing this or anything it was just when she talked here's a bunch of information now now go process and i'm not going to be there to help explain anything hmm. so she was talking about who she had been before and, and my husband would ask her questions and sometimes she got a little defensive. She, I will tell you one thing is they don't like to answer questions. They do not like a people asking questions. Um, so when you say they, who's Julie they? and Chad, Julie and Chad. So after Julie had told us that we went away thinking like, well, what, what do we do now? Like, is this something that it's real? Do we need to think about this for ourselves? Were we people before? Like, that is what goes on in this group. They introduce concepts. They don't expound on them very much. And then they just have you go at it and go figure it out. And then I had text Chad. I had never really talked to him before, but I knew somebody that had his number. So I text him and was like, hey, like, I know that you know about this and Julie kind of explained this, but could you be able to help explain it a little bit more? I'm just trying to find some answers and he would ignore me, would not respond back. And I did that two or three times really? and my husband did that as well. And then he would come back to this person that I know that and would say, I just felt I wasn't supposed to talk to him about it. But as he's doing this in Arizona, he's talking about it with Lori and with Melanie Gibb and he's spreading it all there. But he would not talk about it with certain people here in Idaho at the exact same time as he's doing that to them in Arizona. So he was getting his group of people together as well. Just as Julie was, he was doing the same thing. He was gathering his followers. Yeah. So do you think looking back that he wasn't telling you because you were already Julie's follower and he was getting other people? Or I, don't why know. Was he... I don't know if that, that point, yeah, well, in that point also, they had been in a fight with each other. <laughs> he didn't think it was a good idea that she was doing her energy conferences and asking people for money. And so I think he had told her that. And when we went out to dinner that night with her, she had said that they got in a fight and things aren't good between them anymore. And he doesn't think she should be doing the stuff she's doing. And she's just like, whatever, I'm going to do it. Hmm. So, yeah. Huh. <laughs> so, yeah, the, you know, they had a falling out. Uh -huh. Just so you guys know, I have been following this case since the day that it came out in December of 2019. And I'm sure you've been following it even longer because you were uh -huh. in it. But I've been following it since the day it hit the media. And um, so I remember the first time Julie spoke out when she was yeah. defending Chad. Yeah. I, I remember that video very well. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the day it came out and she said, we had a falling out of yeah. sorts. Is this what, tell us about that. What, what was that about? Um, I think she had gone to his house and it was, it was, she had come to Idaho. She had come to Idaho. Did they have a speaking thing together? She would just come for random Sometimes things. Sometimes she would come for random things to talk to different people, to figure out safe house information. To groom the next guy. And so she was there. I, I can't tell you why. I don't remember. Um, but she had come and she had gone over to his house and somehow they had gotten in a fight or a disagreement. And she, it and and then it was later that we had gone out to dinner with her, and that's when she had said, We got in a fight. And he doesn't like what I'm doing, stuff like that. But she didn't say very much about really what had happened. I think it had been going on for a while. Him being like, I don't think that's a good idea, Julie. I don't think you should be doing that, Julie. And she would disagree with him and be like, I'm going to go do whatever I'm going to do. Well, two people in it for power. I'm sure that they started the butt <laughs> yeah, heads, right? You got two exact same people. One's a male and one's a female doing the exact same thing. And they're both literally doing the same thing but they're both bashing each other behind each other's backs. At this right. Point, yeah. At, at this point, that's what they're doing. Did you two pray about multiple probations um, and get an answer? I mean, at that point, Julie had started really mentioning some, some crazy deeper doctrine stuff in podcasts. So I, so in my marriage, I'm more of the one that looks into those things. I want to understand those things because at that time, I felt within myself like there's more to me. I want to learn more about myself. It had nothing to do with stuff that Julie had said. It just was in me. I want to know what else is there to me? What other gifts yeah. do I have? You know? And so things that she had said along the way were like, oh, well, maybe that's part of my journey. Maybe I need to look into that. So I had, you know, started trying to do my own research of multiple probations. And me and my husband, like we would talk. But he wasn't as much into it and that and those kinds of th like he said he's the more logical one. I'm I'm the opposite. <laughs> we balance each other out. I am sure I went back and prayed and was asking, but it was very confusing. I never got straight answers because then as you do that, then all of a sudden Julie has another podcast that comes out and you're like, well, do I need to think about that, too? It's mm -hmm. just a lot of information. So it's almost confusing. It confuses oh, you. Yeah. It was always confusion. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So at this point, you are acquaintances and are friends, clarify, with Joel, with oh, Eric. Yeah. Um, at that point, uh, multiple probations during that summer of 2018, we had started becoming closer friends with Joel and his wife, just naturally, like my husband and him just got along. They yeah. had done some things, you know, they'd gone meetings together and it just happened like, oh yeah, they just were getting a lot more. So we would go over to their house sometimes and just talk with them, like just like friends, nothing big. And it was just a friendly relationship. When we first moved to Idaho, it wasn't that way as much. I mean, we didn't hate each other or anything, but we just didn't know them very well. As time went on, that's how we became more friends with Joel and his wife. Got it. That year. Okay. So multiple probations got brought up. That was like August or September of 2018. Mm -hmm. In December of that year is when Julie put out that she was doing starting these energy conferences. That's when I was like, oh, Julie, can I help through an email or a text message? Can mm -hmm. I help in this conference? Like, I would like to help. And then that's when she's like, yeah, you can set it up. And you can come for free and your husband can come for free too. Lucky yeah, so, you. <laughs> I know. Right. And I actually was like, I am so excited for this because in my own journey by myself at home, trying to figure things out, I had started learning about certain different methods. I'm learning about foot zoning, essential oils, um, mm -hmm. energy work, all of these things on my own. Holistic healing. Yeah. yeah. Holistic healing stuff. And so just naturally, it, it was just something that I was drawn to more. Energy healing. Yeah. yeah. And that's what Julie's conferences were all about, were energy healing. And, and during that time, also, we were still talking to Joel more. Like, he did come over and help explain a little bit of uh, multiple probation stuff to us because Chad wasn't responding and Julie wasn't going to talk to us. And so... We were like, oh, well, we're friends with Joel. Maybe we'll ask him because he's her spiritual bodyguard. He has to know some of these things. 
So he came over and was just explaining stuff. And we're like, okay, well, that makes sense. You know, I don't know. <laughs> so we were developing this relationship with him of trust is what was going on. So we get to the beginning of 2019 um, in March. March of 2019 is when that energy conference was um, in Idaho Falls with Julie, with all those people there attending, paying money. And um, it starts out really tame. It's a lot of really basic information on this is how you can muscle test to know if you have trapped emotions inside of you that you can release. Like So muscle testing has to do with like a, a yes or no question and you narrow it down, right? Muscle yeah. testing. Yeah. So yeah. it gives you a yes or no answer. And it's basically you asking your spirit, you know, what trapped emotions do I have that are harming my body physically? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a very real thing. It's a very yeah, real thing. It's not thing. unheard of. Right. No, no, no. A lot of people do it. A lot of people do foot zoning. Um, I've done that so, a, a lot and I've had a lot of good experiences with it. It needs yeah. to be approached the right way, but it can be done yeah, correctly. Yeah, all of these things need to be approached with the best pure intent to help. If they're right. not, they can go bad very, very fast. These are all alternative yes. healing and health practices that I have heard of myself. Yeah, and at the beginning, Julie mentioned energy healing in her books, um, emotion code stuff, releasing negative emotions just to help, you know. So mm-hmm. this wasn't a new thing. Um, so she had started this conference. The first class was going fine. And as I had practiced energy healing on myself before, I noticed different things within myself when I would do it. So it definitely takes a lot of energy out of me. I can feel vibrations within my spirit, like just you different things. Feel tired you feel more on. tired. And so as Julie would go on throughout the day, she would stand up in front of people, explain different methods or different you know, experiences or things. And it would go on to be more intense, right? Because as the day goes on, the classes are more advanced. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, she was doing a light surgery, I think on the heart. And she would, she was saying words and she was just like, I'm just going to do this on all of you in here. (laughs) Um, (sighs) Something happened during that. I can't explain it. The only way that I can be able to explain it in a physical uh, mortal's mind is hypnosis. In a spiritual sense, the way it was explained to me and my husband by our father in heaven was that a love potion got placed upon me somehow. I don't, those are the exact words, hypnosis in a physical sense. Okay. Um, the thing with energy work is that the person has to want it. They have to agree like, yes, please do that. I want you to release emotions from me. I want you to do energy work on me. When we were there, everybody was there in the meeting. I mean, nobody said no. I guess she just assumed everybody was okay with it because we all paid to be in there, right? But again, it wasn't like, no, I don't want that done. I don't know what you're doing. So she just spat off, I can't even tell you what they were, words, phrases, spiritual things. I don't even, I can't even remember. But my spirit felt so, like, I felt so different. It was scary. And that was the first time I noticed it. And so my husband was, he felt fine. He felt fine. Other people I knew there felt fine. And I was like, why am I feeling so off? So... We go to the energy conference. Joel was acting weird towards me. And that was the first time I started noticing that he was like starting to make advances towards me. And I was like, okay, I noticed this, but I'm really, I don't want to address it. And I wasn't like doing it back. I just noticed he was doing it to me. And I was like, this is weird. You recognized it. Yeah, Yeah, I recognize it. I'm friends with his wife. Um, We were supposed to be friends. So anyways, this is where it gets really hard because these are the things that like you say out loud and people are like, yeah, right. I don't believe that. Do you know what I mean? And you're like, I don't know how else to explain it to you. This is 
how I saw it and how I felt it. You just know that we there's a lot of good energy on this earth, a lot of good people, but you got to know with the good is the bad. And so there's dark magic here. There's dark energy, you know, so obviously hypnosis can be used in a good way to help people. But if you're doing it for a bad intent, it takes away your agency and it can it they can get things out of you through manipulation as they can do, you know, hypnotize you to get you to do what they want you to do. Let's just say that. Yeah. Um, so there's an energy conference there. Joel said he was learning how to do learning how to do foot zoning. And I was like, Oh, I like to do foot zoning. That's another thing that, you know, I was kind of learning on my own. I didn't go to school for it. There's different ways that I learn. You can figure out how to do those kinds of things. I was like, oh, I like to do that. And so he's like, well, sometime can I be able to come over and and help you and Paul do it? And I was like, okay, like as he's learning experiment. Right. I was like, okay. And he mentioned your husband and it's foot zoning. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's just foot zoning. Just another another thing to note as far as another group was this healing group within East Idaho. There was quite a few that were starting this. So there was another inner group yeah that was doing all this healing in east idaho yeah another another character in my story in my light prevails podcast um she was known as the sorceress that's what i named her in the podcast um she was known as one she was teaching joel she she teaches these classes julie was very close to her she wrote a book on releasing emotions i don't know her as a person so i can't say good or bad things. I just know that she was doing these things. She was teaching them and Joel was learning from her how to do it. He was close. He was friends with her. He was close just because from Julie, I'm sure. And I I don't know (sighs) the problem with a lot of these men, Chad, Joel, and other people, they didn't have daytime jobs to keep them busy. Hmm. Their wives were working. Interesting. Yeah. So they would go off and do their work for Julie or learn these things as their wives are working and they, but most of the time what they did was with other women. Okay. And why, why do you think they weren't working? Was it because they thought they were special during this? Yeah. Work for- yes. And they didn't want to. <laughs> At this point, I think, well, I don't know for sure. This is just speculation for me, but I'm pretty sure that Joel was getting paid by Julie. As her spiritual body. Now I know that there was one time specifically when we were at at this conference that I bodyguard for in February or March, March at the March, 2019, yeah, in Idaho Falls. they were doing audio and video for it. And Joel's son was running all the equipment and she had talked to the, Julie. So Julie had talked to the son and said, you know, I, whenever you get that done, I'll get you paid for it. So, so I know that he was getting paid. So I can only assume that Joel was getting paid to go and travel to all of these events. Because he to would be, be the there bodyguard. with her. He would travel to Hawaii and go on these other places with her to be her bodyguard. And the other guy that was that was um, organizing them all that lives in Pace, and I'm pretty sure he was getting paid, but I don't know for sure. That's just me assuming that the the key top people were getting paid, and that's because none of them had jobs. So. They, they had, had make- before, but at this time, they didn't. That was a pattern that we noticed with these They had men. to have money to pay the bills somehow. So Joel wanted to know if he could practice some of his things he was learning, uh, foot zoning. Um, and so I said, okay. So he came over to our house, and his wife came with him, and Paul was there. Like, we were all in the same room together, and he, he zoned Paul's feet first, and a little awkward because the guy doing it on a guy's feet, you know, like, so Paul's like, it was a little awkward, but yeah. it was fine, and then when he got to my feet, it was, I felt again how I felt in that energy conference, like, I was under some hip, hypnotic state, and he was looking at me differently, like, I could just sense it and feel it, but mm-hmm. what do I say at that time? I, I could have said, no, you're right. <laughs> but I didn't because I didn't know what was going on. So, and they were supposed to be our friends. Like he was supposed to be our friend. And anyway, so I noticed that was going on. 
Um, he'd use essential oils because that's, you know, what you do when you do foot zoning, you apply essential oils on different oils can help with different ailments or you can, yeah, you can pray or bless, bless them to help pray for them. The oils, just like you can do anything, whatever he was doing, it was foot zoning, but in a spiritual sense, manipulation sense, it was using that as a means to get closer to me. Right. And manipulate me more. I believe that when I was in the energy conference, I think that's when it started. But and and then as he came around, then I noticed different things. But so then they got done zoning our feet and he left. And then he texted me the next day and was just like, Hey, how you doing from it? And I'm like, I definitely felt some different things. And he's like, Oh, that's good. That's good. And I'm and some of it had to do with multiple probation stuff of did you okay so as this woman was teaching foot zoning she mingled in energy work somehow so not only are you foot zoning and touching the person physically they were trying to do energy work which means getting to your spirit to figure out things is what they were doing tapping into the subconscious is what somebody would say yes okay from the world but in that sense, it's spiritual. Right, right. So I knew that he was learning this from this lady. And I asked him when he texted me, I was like, yeah, I feel different. But like, did you find anything out? Like, meaning multiple probation stuff or anything about me? Like, I obviously at that point, I was naive to this stuff. Yeah, people can say like, well, you were dumb. Like, I had no idea. This stuff was all new with multiple probations and the way they were teaching energy. Here. Right, right. So I didn't know. So mistakes were made. Yeah, I think that's one yes. thing I want to make clear that a lot of others that were in this group don't want to admit to that there was mistakes made and things that we could have done to change, change to, things. Yeah, to shield or protect ourselves more, but we didn't. And so a uh, us specifically, there's a lot of shame involved with that, right? Because you made a mistake, you sinned, or yeah, you were taken advantage of. And so that's very real. And that's part of the process that we had to go through. But yes, yeah, I want to see what you said, taking advantage of, I'm sensing myself a lot of grooming. Yeah, oh, absolutely. A yeah, grooming, a, lot, a of lot of grooming, you to trust them. Uh huh. To put your trust in them. Yeah, this is right. This is good. So I want you to know that I'm seeing a yes, absolutely. A hundred percent. And so he's like, but there's some things that I learned. And so I want to come over and, and talk to you guys about it. And so we're like, okay, like, what could this mean? <laughs> and so he came over that night and shared with us that on his way over, he had received a revelation about me and that I was such and such person that had lived at a different time and like wasn't it guinevere um it wasn't it wasn't guinevere so the story of uh, lancelot and guinevere mm-hmm. or they, or, it was a different lady but it was like kind of the same concept that lived at the same time and i was involved in a love triangle in that story and i'd never heard of who this person was that was a previous probation that was a, one of my previous probations according to joel so i was like what okay, I don't even know who this person is. I Googled them and I was like, well, that person sounds like a horrible person because they were having an affair. <laughs> they were married to somebody else and having an affair with somebody else. And I was like, that, that is not me. I don't do that stuff. You know, hindsight, that was actually something that Heavenly Father helped us to use against Joel to help us figure out truth. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of priming here, priming your brain. Okay, yeah. So you think things, it's, it's interesting. Yes, okay, good. Mm-hmm. yep. Yep, exactly. Um, and so they would put thoughts into your your brain, right? To think like, well, yeah, that's it. I, I received this for you and I'm close to Julie. So you're like, you got to trust me. And we did put trust in him, right? Because there were other times when they were willing to help us out. Right. And this is Julie's bodyguard. You this know? is Julie's bodyguard. He's supposed to be a good guy. So then the other nine times that he helped me, it turned out really good, you know? So I need to trust on this 10th time. Because right. the other nine exactly. were good. Isn't that how Satan works? 
he'll tell you a bunch of truth. And then one time there's a little bit of faults in there and it's very, it can be very vague and very like sneaky and subtle. So he told us that. And then we went on a trip somewhere the next day, as we're processing all this, we're talking about all this stuff that he was saying. He also told Paul that Paul had lived at a different time with him and was we were friends. We were. Yeah. See, they were friends. He was Alma the Younger and I was one of his. Friends to help. Friends, like a business consultant guy that was helping him when he was the king or when he was the leader. Yeah. Alma See? the Younger. Right. Putting thoughts in our heads. We're buddies. You can trust me. Right. And so I get back from this trip we were on and me, as I've been developing developing my own gifts. I like to write things down and I like to do research. And so he had said some information. And so what I felt was, okay, I need to know, like, what was this revelation again that you said? Specifically. I want to write it down and I'm going to go back and I'm going to ask Heavenly Father and I'm going to like do some research. Do I feel that this is true? Is this something that I relate to? I don't know yet. So I'm going to ask. So I text him and he's like, well, how about we talk on the phone? And I was like, Ugh. I sat there for like 15 minutes and I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I should, because at that point, the hypnosis part was like very, very strong. I don't, I don't know how, it, I don't know how hypnosis works per se. I don't know how long it can go. I don't know if certain things trigger certain things to happen, but I had been told in my own discernment and revelation that I knew Joel and I knew him from somewhere else. And so as I had already been told that, I was like, well, I know him already. So maybe it does mean that, you know, I've been with him before because that's what I'm feeling inside. And you're getting confirmation for what he's just shared with you. Yes, absolutely. Yep. And so I'm like, okay. So we talked on the phone and he just let it all out of like, you, we were married together. We did this and this together. This is who you were. This is who I am. And And I'm like sobbing on the phone because I'm married to Paul. I'd never had these feelings for Joel ever before. Like honest, I can say honest, 100% never had. Um, But at that time I was like, but why am I thinking that that I am supposed to, but yet, and you're telling me that I'm supposed to, but I've never had a confirmation that this was actually true. And he wouldn't leave me alone. Like he would continue to keep texting me throughout that whole week. And just, I love you. I love you. We are eternal companions. We're supposed to be together. We're supposed to create worlds together. Like I'm talking right now to you about this, the best that I've ever talked about it. Like the most confident in what I know is true, but it has been the hardest week that I've ever experienced. Well, one of the two hardest weeks I've ever experienced in my life. It was so extremely scary. Because I love Paul and I'd never had those feelings for another and especially not him while I've been married to Paul. And it was so scary because in my head, it's like I was having things put in me to think that I was right. Right. But then during that whole week, I was being reminded and I'm sure it was like my guardian angels, our heavenly parents of like, no, you got this with Paul. Remember you're married to Paul. So it was like this tug of war that was going on inside me. Um, and at the end of that week, like it just got crazy. Uh, nothing ever happened, but just, he told me he loved me. Like I'd never had that before. What do you do? You're married. I'm married. What are you doing? And so at the end of that week on that Sunday, I was very clearly told it's time to tell Paul all this it's time to tell him. Cause I hadn't told him I was scared to death. I didn't even know what was going on. I just knew like my brain was foggy. I was feeling things I had never felt before for another person that weren't real. I know they weren't real, but at the time it was so confusing. And so I told, I was told you're supposed to tell Paul and you're supposed to end this now. So I told Paul and that day sucked. <laughs> Let's just say it was a horrible day for both of us. It was the most eye-opening day for the most, or for both of us as well. That was you reaching out for help. That was me reaching out for help. Paul was told as he was struggling through it of 
look, my friend, this guy that's supposed to be my friend is now after my wife and wants to take her. Basically, what do I do? Or I'm angry and I'm pissed or, you know, all these emotions that he's You're dealing with. You're having an affair, so I'm going to leave. Right. You know? Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, wait, did I just do that? Like, what is going on? It happens so fast. Not a physical affair. No. A psychological or yeah. spiritual affair. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so, but he was told, this isn't about you. Like him. This is about him. This is about me. <laughs> You're supposed to help her through this. She needs help through this to get through this and um so ever since then like we were by each other's side like we were there to help each other and of course you know it was still such a struggle because as you're doing that you're realizing all the things that you had done or said and you're like i'm a horrible person like what am i doing in order to get healing you've got to talk about specifics yeah you know, and so that hurts yeah and so it was it was extremely hard but during that day well, that day and the next day, something I think is very important is that Paul had talked to Joel that night on that Sunday. And Joel basically had told him that now spiritual wivery exists and this is real and this is what's happening. And you should be OK. Sharing We're all going to be. This is the doctor yes. who shared with me. With, this was Eric and Eric Smith. Joel Gervin. Yes. They, they so both they agreed with this. They shared with me that. The way that eternal marriage works is that we are all married to each other in heaven. And basically, we just decide who we're going to procreate with or have spiritual children with. But yeah. we're all married to each other. A lot of these teachings came from Eric Smith because he was known in the group as a very insightful he was Isaiah in a previous life. He was Isaiah. So he's very <laughs> what he doctrinally sound, yes. quote unquote. Um, yeah. So how do you like that? <laughs> so we're like, oh, okay. Um, Paul hadn't told me that they had said that. If I would have known that, I, I don't. Just another layer, right? Just another thing. To clarify, spiritual library exists. Polygamy. Polygamy. <laughs> yeah. But what about what about women having multiple husbands? That wasn't talked about. Unless you're Julie. Unless you're Julie Rowe. So that, Julie, yes, but not men. Yeah. Men had multiple wives. So polygamy was taught. This yeah. has been a question. Polygamy was taught. Yeah. And what about and when we're talking about sharing spiritually sharing spouses, are we talking about right now in our mortal? Uh, they were practicing it. Let's just say that. I'm sure. That's what they insinuated, <laughs> yes, right? That's, they that's insinuated. the next step is if you accept the spiritual doctrine, well, then let's just live it right now. Yeah. Yes. And that was where this was headed, right? With Joel. That's why he was grooming me. That's where this was headed. Because another pattern that happens with these people is that we noticed a lot of their spouses were supposed to die. So when no yes. one was married to their we eternal know about companion. Jeff Rowe. Jeff Rowe, Julie said that yeah, he was supposed to. Jeff Rowe was supposed to. We know he that was. Tammy was supposed to. Tammy was supposed to. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Carl um, was supposed to. And yes. He did. Joel's. Yeah, absolutely. Joel told me that his wife was supposed to. And you know what? I have nothing bad to say about her. Joel's wife. I was friends with her. I feel for her. Just on record. That's what I want to be known. I feel bad. Yeah, we've been over to their house. We've we have children that are the same ages as their children. You know, there it's a whole family that is affected. A lot of these things that they were teaching didn't really involve their wives in it. They knew about them. And I do know that some of the wives were having emotional affairs with other men in this group. So the women were doing it too. I don't think Joel's wife was. She doesn't seem like that kind of person. I don't think she believed it. But I could be wrong. But did Tammy, Tammy Debo, did oh, I, don't, I don't think I don't. There was no evidence for, for Tammy doing that. No. She really was clean, stuck to herself. Yep. Just she was a good supported, person. Supported Chad, uh -huh. was hardworking. Yes. Um, yes, so, that's how I see Tammy too. Yes, she, absolutely. She, she kept their marriage together. She was the breadwinner. Uh -huh. She worked hard. She managed the publishing company and she supported yep. Chad and whatever it was he was doing. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. And and they grew up in the generation, and I just, this is generalizing, right? Where the husband is the leader in the family and you just follow whatever they do, right? That. That generation, they grew up, they, that the husband was 
the all knowing and whatever he said went and the woman just supported it. It's not, not the way it's supposed to be taught doctrinally within the church. However, that was kind of the overarching emphasis was the woman supports the husband and just listens to what he says. Absolutely. And that's how I sense the Tammy and Chad Daybell relationship. I think so. I think so. I agree with what you just said there. Um, And I want to speak to the strength of your relationship um, too. Clearly you have a strong loving relationship and I can see that other couples would not make it the way. That's why they didn't make it. I can tell you at least a handful of other couples that have gotten divorced. Um, They did have affairs. Obviously people died. Um, Yeah. This doctrine was so dangerous and the way they were going about it was just like, it was just another normal everyday conversation. Um, so as I was coming out of this hypnosis, like Paul, he really helped me to see that these things weren't true. And, and I, of course had my own journey to figure a lot of this stuff out. But the, the really cool thing about all this is that heavenly father had been preparing us for this moment. And so we had had dreams previously. We had different impressions that we had written down and those things helped to show us in this moment that all these things were really happening. Like I will tell you right now, it was, it was the coolest experiences that we have had to really learn the truth, but they couldn't come from natural man. They came from our father in heaven and, and Jesus Christ, because they knew that we were going to be put up against this. I can't explain it any other way, but yeah. these people didn't know that we had had all these other experiences. So they thought that they were really, you know, tricking us. And in the, in the end it was like, well, actually we learned a lot of stuff. <laughs> so anyways, um, was Julie having an affairs with other men then? <laughs> I don't have proof of it. So I'm not going to say yes or no. However, I do know very men were in love with her. We'll say that. And I, I, yeah, (laughs) we can, we can assume, but I don't have proof. The one important thing that I want to say and of sharing that experience, because who wants to admit like, well, you had an emotional affair with somebody or you sinned and you made things. I was deceived so much, right? By Joel. When I saw Chad and Lori's story come out, I knew Chad in a different way. I never saw him like that as he was on TV. I, we even saw him like two months before Tammy died. Um, at a ward party. At, a, at an LDS ward party. We sat next to him. At that point, he was talking a little bit more to us. We sat next to him and he was, his demeanor was different. He wasn't like he was on TV. He was friendly. He was nice, but he was saying certain things that he was doing in his life, but he was actually saying it about other people. <laughs> That's how yeah. they work. I don't know why. They, the projection. Yeah. They want people to know what they're doing, but yet they don't want to get caught. So they like say it in a secret way or something. What did he say other people were doing? Well, he was talking about Melanie Gibb and David Warwick. And just what they were doing. That they were both married. That they were both married and they wanted to get divorced and be together. Which, Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously that did happen, but he's literally doing the same thing with Lori at the exact same time as he's saying this. Right. But we had no idea. We had no idea that he was this close to people in Arizona. But what was weird at that word party, we were there for... We were there for probably a couple hours. A couple hours. Tammy was there. Their kids were there. It was a swim party. So, so, every, so uh, Chad and his wife showed up with their kids, and they all sat over there for a minute. And then it wasn't too long after he had ate, he come and sat down by right in between Wait, us. And, and just some other people that we knew. Yeah, that- there, was, there was quite a few of us there. But what was weird is he never got up to go check on his wife, talk to Tammy or go, Hey, I got to go be with my family. You know, all my kids are here. I want to be over with them. You know, I can understand coming to me and cordial for a few minutes. Cause we knew him and the people we were with knew him too, but he literally sat there the whole for time. Like two we hours and just sat and talked to us. Didn't care where Tammy was at. Didn't care where the kids were at. Had no care in the world about what was going on. He had talked to us a little bit, but I had never talked to him 
for that long at one time. He just and he wasn't talking about a lot of spiritual deep things. They were it was just more just like life stuff. stuff. Yeah, yeah, more life stuff. How's- so we were like, oh, does he actually like us? Because he ignored us for a while, <laughs> wouldn't respond back to us. Now all of a sudden, um, and so when I saw Chad on TV with Lori. It struck me so strong that what I experienced, I'm afraid Lori has experienced as well. And I'm not saying Chad also hasn't had some manipulation and stuff, but he's done a lot of it. So what I experienced was the hypnosis, the, there are things that I thought that like, I had never thought of before. The emotions I felt, I never felt before. And I could see that within her. Like, where were her kids? She wasn't fighting for them. She loved Chad, supposedly. Like, she would die for him, right? It's what it seemed. Mm-hmm. It was so similar. And that was something that told me inside me that this is why I was supposed to go through that experience. Because I needed to know that is something that all these people are doing to so many other people. They're manipulating people and they can use hypnosis to do it. Yeah, and we pray that, you know, obviously as, as she's today, I think they're taking her to the state hospital to get some help. Lori Vallow. Right. I hope that she finds some of that healing and some of that ability to process what what she did. What was going what on? she did. And, you know, we have our suspicions that she may have been manipulated or hypnotized just like this. And I'm not saying that she didn't go in it agreeing to do some things with Chad. I don't know. I never knew her. I only heard of her podcast with Jason Mao and Melanie Gibb and, and Thor. And I thought they were, you know, good, but I had never met any of them. Um, and so when I saw her, I was like, oh, my word that is something that's happening. Sounds and very her. similar. Yep. yep. And then how am I supposed to tell people? Like, who's going to believe me? I'm still you trying sound, to process Yeah, you it. sound crazy, right? Oh, hip, they can't hip, no, hypnotize you without you wanting to do it. Don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah, they, they, they can, but it takes away your agency. And that's why where it took away my agency there were things that I was doing or said or thought that I wouldn't normally do. And, and I was reminded of that after my experience of, you know what, you know, you know, you didn't love Joel. You never did. Like, you know, your foundation. Remember that. Yeah. You've kind of answered the Lori question. You believe that Lori, um, believed Chad. Do you think Chad fully believed himself too? Yeah. Okay. I do, but I also, you had asked me before that question or if he was catfishing mm-hmm. and I both was going on. He was being somebody he wasn't. Yeah. And that's the catfishing side, but. but he and he also... was luring people in by these spiritual grand revelations to get people to do what he wanted. And then he was deceived. And he was also deceived at the same time. And, and causing <laughs> that deception on others. And he wasn't careful. I believe these people do have some of these gifts that they say they do. But the problem is, is that they never checked themselves. Like, they were never like, am I still on the right track? Is this a good thing to do? Am I helping people? They, I don't believe they ever did that. And that's why him and Julie are at where they're at now. They never checked themselves, but they sure told everybody else to do it. They said a lot of things for everybody else to do, but they didn't actually do it themselves. Right. Mm-hmm. Did you know Lori? Did you meet Lori? No. Never did. No, nope. we never met her. She came on the scene right right about the time that all this was going on, and we had started to separate ourselves yeah. when the multiple probations come out. It just didn't sit right with us. And we had distanced ourselves a little bit on the whole thing. Well, obviously after my experience, but after that, Paul had told him and he's like, don't talk to us anymore. Yeah. You are evil. Yeah. I had a very (laughs) pointed conversation with Joel and I said, don't you ever contact us again. Mm -hmm. And And then we're still members of the church of Jesus Christ. Oh, yep. We're still members. Yep. We go. Yeah. We've been going the whole time. I would say that my testimony is stronger now on doctrine of the church and my relationship with Christ is stronger than it's ever been. And the same with mine. And throughout all of this, it, it has grown, but with other people, they let other things get in the way to weaken their testimonies or to weaken their faith. That's what we saw. We saw these patterns. I don't, 
seems like they went away from the basics and got so worried about yes. this grand doctrine and didn't continue. The they basics. got stuck on a certain doctrine and forgot about, yeah, their foundation, their basics. They okay. wanted to be really cool, important people, but not accepting who they really are right now. Yeah. Is, Joel, is Joel still her bodyguard? Do I don't know. Okay. The I, last day we'd heard, um, they were starting to distance themselves from each other, Julie and Joel. Yeah, but you also so see, know. just like with the YouTube channel, Eric used to be involved with everything, and he's not involved with it anymore. He's not either. Uh, as far as I know, she's doing everything on her own. But we don't know. For I'm sure. not sure who was helping her with her YouTube video, the last one when she started, and somebody was right. starting for and everything. I'm not sure who's doing that. Very but. well could be him. But it seems like everybody's oh, kind of distanced themselves. Yeah, I yeah. She does have, you know, people that still listen to her and follow her and everything like that. But I think the overall majority of people that were there in the beginning, I don't think they're there anymore. But yeah, Eric Eric got excommunicated, yeah. obviously. You know that he came out and said that. Julie was excommunicated. We did um from some people that we do know, Julie had talked to them. And she told them that uh, she was just using some of these people and that when she's done with them, she's done with them. Like she'll just throw them to the side. Yeah. That's secondhand. So she told it to uh -huh. these people we know and they told it to us. Meaning I would assume Eric. Chad and Julie kind of when people don't work for them anymore, <laughs> yeah. they're not benefiting them. They're yes. not as important anymore. Well, and not only that, but I would assume you're basically known as an evil person. That's usually you what you don't believe what they're that's usually what they anymore. say. Oh, they got deceived and now they're they were, dark. Yeah. And I would assume, you know, that we were put in that category because we supposedly betrayed Julie because we left. And now we're doing this interview and I did my podcast and But but just like this um scenario where the girl on fire was um hypnotized and you know we I helped her get through it and she helped me to get healing as well. Is that that in this whole thing that if they had allowed the light and love of Christ to to just guide and heal them, all of the healing would have taken place. You know, a lot of this evil wouldn't have happened. Yeah, right. and that's what got me and Girl on Fire through it, and that's why we're still together. Is love, you know, just it was love, pure love. Love prevails, yeah. and that's the motivation behind this is, you know, let, let's try to get some healing and some love and not more hate and content and anger towards these people and understanding motivation will help to say, you know, maybe Lori isn't as evil as she seems. She could have been manipulated pretty heavy and maybe Chad was hypnotized by Julie. I don't know. It doesn't take away the fact that they're going to be held accountable for these alleged crimes that they're, you know, that they did with, yeah. been charged with. But, but, you know, there is some reasoning on why it happened. You know, they there's a lot of a man, manipulation within this group. Um, feelings between uh, a male and a female were manipulated yeah. heavily. You know, you see within the group, I experienced a lot. Not, ex not personally, but I saw a lot of the women would always talk to the men and the men would always talk to the women. Yeah. Very rarely was it a relationship where it was, hey, we're, we can be friends, you know, a, a male to a male and a female to a female. It was very There was a rare. lot of jealousy very that rare. was just thrown, like energy, je jealousy energy that was just thrown around to people. Um, you know, and that would create it so that women didn't want to talk to women. Well, I'm jealous of you because what you have these spiritual gifts and I don't. So mm -hmm. I don't want to talk to you, you know, just like some of the others in the group. You know, I had more spiritual power or oomph than the other person. But what does that have to do with anything? You it know, doesn't. we're all trying <laughs> to help each other become more spiritual. We're helping each other to become stronger and, well, and a obtain. better person. Yeah. And we shouldn't be trying to cut each other down and jealous and take advantage yeah. and manipulate and hypnotize and 
get money out of people and all this other evil that mm-hmm. came from the group. Looking back, do you, do you, do you call this a cult yourself? Do you see Julie as a cult or Chad as a cult? Oh yeah. Uh-huh. By definition, you betcha. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a fun thing to say that you were part of a cult, but. But we, it is, we have been shown and taught through our own revelations, our own discernment, our own journey that this was supposed to happen. We learn things to help people. You can agree with it or you don't have to, but the one people or the one person that's searching for answers, they come across this, they'll get what they need. That one person that I can help, that's what this is for. In the end, we're stronger than we were before. Yeah. Yeah. I see that. You guys are a strong, wonderful couple. Um, I appreciate you saying that the motivations are important because as you've listened to our podcast, that's what Dr. John and I focus on are the motivations because we can't keep something like this from happening again if we don't understand the why. Uh So I just want to say thank you to this incredible interview. You're the first people that were within this that have come out to talk to me. And so I just want to ask again, why you decided (laughs) to start sharing the story? Well, when I started my podcast and shared my story, it was, it was because I started my healing. I needed to start healing and I needed to talk about it. Yeah. My own personal healing. And I needed to talk about it, but also some of it was that I needed to expose the darkness that's happening. And now as time has gone on, I realized my voice is to help spread hope. And this is where I get emotional because there are so many people that are too scared to say anything. They're afraid they're going to get caught. They're afraid they're going to get in trouble. And there's so many people that never intended for any of this to happen. So many people. And they're so ashamed that they were, that they knew Chad or they know Julie, but I know the atonement is real. And Jesus Christ is real. And if they would just turn to him and give him their sorrows and their sins and their mistakes, their life would be so much happier and better and lighter. And even Chad and Lori, if they could just admit the truth, whatever it is, because I don't think anybody here is ever going to know why they did. I don't know if they know exactly how it got to that point with them, where they did what they did. Heavenly Father and Christ know. They're the two important ones that should know, right? And they will have to address that with them at some point. They will have to take accountability for it. But even all these other people, even Joel, he's human just like me. He makes mistakes. Uh, I've sinned, obviously, too. So I can't put all of this negative energy on these people. These are facts. These things happened. But there's always another way and there's always forgiveness. And and they and Christ, he's the ultimate judge. He will judge us on how we act through these things and what we say. We are our ultimate critics. We judge each other so harshly here. And he's like, I'm giving you five, six, seven, you know, times to to repent. He, He is nothing like us where we are so we want to bring people down and it's easier to do that when you see these negative things happen, like with Chad and Lori, but I can't tell you why Chad and Lori did what they did. I don't know why Julie's doing that. I'm sure there's a lot of pain within her, Mm -hmm. a lot of internal pain with these people. And these are the things that come out. This is how they're trying to deal with it. I, I don't know, but people got hurt. So I'm here to spread hope to stop this, to continue on. Thank you. There's a quote that I love that um, being brave is not the opposite of fear. It's realizing something's more important than fear. And I know that you two are scared and have fear coming forward, but you also know that there are dead children and dead spouses. People have died. Uh huh. That should never have happened. Right. Should never have happened. And that's why my podcast was about choices. Every choice that we come across in our life is important. Well, you know, what do you wear today? Wow. But there are more important choices that are at hand of how are you going to treat this person? Are you going to be kind? Are you trying to get things from them? You know, I think we need to look at ourselves and say, am I, is this helping me be a better person? Or am I bringing people down? 
I think that's a huge thing that we, everybody needs to work on. Thank you for being brave and sharing your story. I think it's going to help a lot of people and I think it's going to allow more people to be brave. Yeah. And we want people to see it for what it was. Uh-huh. And what it is. So right. I just want to say thank you. Your podcast, Girl on Fire on YouTube, is it anywhere else or is it just on YouTube? No, it's just on YouTube. Um, I don't know if you ever answered this, but why did you want to interview us? My husband and I started our podcast, Hidden, a true crime podcast, where mm-hmm. we were uh, trying to get into the hidden modus yeah. of the Daybell case, the Lori Vallow Chad Daybell case. And that's what mattered to us. And so we started in assessing Chad and Julie and their backgrounds. Mm-hmm. And when I started listening to you, it was to learn. It was yeah. to understand the dynamics of the group or the cult or to understand how this happened. But I think it was two things. It was your last podcast where I heard your voice getting stronger. Mm-hmm. And then it was the mix of Sean Little Bear's interview mm-hmm. where I learned a lot more, followed by Julie's response. Okay. To the interview. I thought it's time to peel back this layer of the onion. Yeah. And we need some answers. And I hope that someone that was a part of this will talk to us and share what's really happening. I I realized I needed some concrete answers. And in addition to that, I get emails and messages from people all the time saying, thank you for what you're doing. My family is following Julie Rowe. Mm -hmm. My my mother's money is gone. Her savings gone because she's preparing and she's following Julie Rowe. Keep going, keep doing what you're doing. And honestly, my, my response has been, well, I don't know if I'm doing that much but as i've peeled back as i said the layers um i think we're finally getting there and i've realized i I do want to help whatever it is that's happening what can i do to help what do we need to figure out here Mm -hmm. so um your interview was important to me and since now that we're at the end of the interview Mm -hmm. it's more important to me than i even realized I want to say that. I think as this as time goes on, we realize more of our purpose in this. Like yes. each person. 